Hello, everybody, and welcome to another I Really Do Hope That My Co-Host Has Turned Down His Headset Now That The Music Played episode of Pottywood. I am one of your co-hosts, Steve Hester, and with me as always is... The person who is not Steve Hester. Yes. That would be me, Andrew Roger Carson. Uh, writer, director, podcaster... Cheesemaker. Writer of the Penny Farthing. <laughs> Whatever you want. Yeah, all of the above. It's, uh, it starts to get a bit cold at the moment, hasn't it? Or is it just me? It's bloody freezing. Yes. Uh, I hate this time. Well, you know I hate this time of year. Yeah. You know, I, I suffer with the winter blues a lot, which is like the the worst sounding jazz album you can ever find <laughs> in a bargain bin. No, it's not a good season. Um, It's cold. It's miserable. It's like being married. <laughs> Oh, wow. That's a dark take right from the off. Uh, welcome to our fun and exciting podcast. <laughs> uh, we try our best. We, we do, Well, we we try. Whether or not we get there, that's a different story altogether. And speaking of which... What? No, I thought that might be a segue, but, you know, it's... It, yeah, whatever. Oh, no, no, no. You, you just got to muscle through your segue. And speaking of muscling through your segue, oh, Steve... Oh, God. Let's talk about last week's... <laughs> What's in the barking bin of hell? Uh, when we pulled out Rennie Harlan's The Legend of Heracles. Yes. Uh, which isn't actually a mispronunciation. You're not mispronouncing your worms. Uh, Heracles is the original Greek name for Hercules, and then the Romans adapted it, just like they did all of the Greek pantheon of gods and demigods and all the rest of it, and turned it into Hercules. So, this is the... Technically, the first of two uh, Hercules movies that were released in 2014. The first, which is called Hercules, and that starred Rock the Dwayne Johnson, Ian McShane, and John Hurt. And this other one, The Legend of Hercules, starred. Kellen Lutz. Kellen Lutz, yes. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> after rifling through to get that name, uh, I know that I, I, I've i sensed this week whenever I have checked in on you watching this movie and your mood shifted. And I know for a fact that you ended up watching it. <laughs> and I, I can did. tell exactly when. I did. Uh, right, let's get this out of the way with the story of Hercules. For those of you who didn't know, uh, is he is a demigod. His father was Zeus. He was sent down to Earth. And then he, throughout his life, was kind of at, at odds with a goddess called Hera. Famously, he did 12 tasks. Only one of them appears in the film, which was... I thought uh, that was Asterix. Ah, no, it, it was Asterix, The Twelve Tasks of Asterix, which is a far superior film. Yes, and the only comic book that was actually in an actual reading book form. Yes. It, was wonderful. it wasn't in a comic strip. Wonderful. I remember I watched that all the bloody time when I was a kid. What, uh, the animated movie of it? The animated movie, yeah. Do you know what? That was on during a Christmas on ITV at something like five in the morning. Why? And I woke up to watch it at five in the morning because it was the only one you could not buy on VHS anywhere. Couldn't find it. Oh, no, I had it on VHS. You bastard. You're the I person who bought it. Yeah, I had it on VHS. I wore the damn thing out. No, I, I got my Asterix in Britain, and I was so happy with that. And then I got Asterix and Cleopatra, and I was like, what year was this made? <laughs> what, kind of car- what kind of cartoon is this? What bugged me about them, though, is that they never had the same voice cast for each consecutive movie. So you get used to one asterisk and obelisk sounding one way, and then you put on a different movie and they sounded completely different. Yeah, like that time it was Bill Oddie. Yes. Was it was that the one that was Asterix in That was Asterix in the Big Fight. Was it? No, this is how great the legend of Hercules is. <laughs> we have actually seeged into children's cartoons. I know it's it's far better than talking about the film. Okay, just just for reference for the history buffs out there, the twelve tasks were slay the Nemean lion, which he does in the film, kind of at the beginning. Slay the nine headed yes, we'll, we'll Lernian Hydra. Capture the Serenian Hind. Capture the um 
Erymanthian boar, clean the Aegean stables in a day, slay the Stymphalian birds, capture the Cretan bull, steal the mares of Diomedes, uh, obtain the girdle of Hippolyta, queen of the Amazon. Ooh. <laughs> obtain the cattle of the three-bodied giant Geryon, steal the three of the golden apples from the Hesperides, Hesperides, and finally twelve, capture and bring back Cerberus. All See, heady that's, stuff. That's that's twelve great movies. Yeah, that are not this one. <laughs> no, what we have here is basically an overlong pilot for one of those swords and sandals TV shows, kind of like Spartacus, except with way too much influence from three hundred, without any kind of sense as to what made that film work or yes. be in any way visually exciting or interesting. Yeah. The colour is crunched down so much in this, it's hard to see what's going on at times. It's washed out, it's grey, there's conflicting blues against yellows. There, yeah. There's so much unnecessary, I think, what is it, frame cranking? Over cranking? Yeah. That that thing where the, the action slows down and then speeds back up in again. Ev- in every single action scene. Because it had to be three D. Yes. Yeah. But you... also the film would only be fifteen minutes long if it didn't have that. Pretty much. Because yeah. the the opening sequence is designed to make people go, Oh wow, three D. Oh god, the sol there's helmets flying, oh the soldiers dying, oh there's arrows whistling through the sea, which wouldn't happen, but oh my god, all this stuff's going on. And completely make you forget that you're watching someone with a knockoff Chris Hemsworth trying to oil <laughs> his way through the film. Well, a knockoff Jared Butler and a knockoff Lena Headey, who both yes. look younger than their children, yes. stomp and pride about the place <laughs> like people from a goddamn pantomime. Oh. See, now you've just talked all my points in one go. It's, it's, pretty, much, much? it's pretty much that. This, what happens in this movie is a scene starts, someone says like two lines, randomly kind of like in the middle of a conversation, then the scene randomly ends, and then something completely different starts off. Yes. It, it, it happens over and over and over again. You want a scene to start off at one point, have a logical progression, and then finish at an end point now usually if it's a character dialogue you want it to be relatively long a few minutes so that way you can establish character you can establish motivation you can establish a uh, narrative thread going forwards none of that happens no it, it's just things happen without any explanation as to why they happen like they get captured uh, Hercules basically gets sent away by his dad, who wants to just spend all his time wandering around with a beard and shouting at people, um, and sends him away because he knows that he's the product of ghost sex with his mum. And <laughs> then the entire company that goes to Egypt gets massacred, apart from him and one of the bloke. And then at some point, the bloke and him escape after winning his uh, freedom in a gladiatorial contest. And then all of a sudden he arrives back home and you're there thinking, why, how did he arrive there? And in case you're wondering, Steve, what you're saying makes no sense. It's just like watching this film. Yes. These are two uh, hours of non sequiturs. Okay. I have some talking points on this. Really? Movie. Okay. Yes. Because I watched it earlier in the week because also I have to watch all of the anniversary movies again. So, I watched it earlier this week, and it wasn't the most pleasant day no. I've ever had. Because, what? This is Rennie Harlan. This is Die Hard Rennie Harlan. Die, well, die, die Hard, hard 2, two, I Rennie should say. Hard. This is Cliffhanger yeah. Rennie Harlan. Yes, this and this is what happens after Driven and Cutthroat Island Rennie Harlan. This is what happens yeah. after lots and lots of cocaine Rennie Harlan. Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm not touching that one, Steve. We'll get sued. <laughs> That's what he should have said. Um, or oh, you'll get cast. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I, I noticed the thing here is this is basically like watching if Sunset Beach. Oh yeah, did an episode 
based around Hercules. It is. These people are immaculately shaven. I don't think Hercules was ever as shaven as much as this guy. And I know that they shaved the chest and all that because it was being shot for three D, and you know hairy chest and that don't mix well with the three D conversion. So say goodbye to your seventies porn films being revamped. I guess. No, they went um, straight to VR. Yeah, yeah. Oh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I did notice for a movie steeped in Greek mythology and Greek legends, you didn't have one Greek actor in the entire cast. No, I guess not Anthony, one. I was going to say, well, maybe Anthony Quinn's dead, but then he's Mexican, so Anthony Quinn wasn't in this movie. I know, and he's dead as well. So I was thinking he was well, in Zorba the Greek. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he. That's where it was coming from. Random point there. No. Um. <laughs> Yeah, obviously, it's not the best Hercules movie of 2014, and neither was Dwayne The Rock Johnson's uh, Hercules movie either. <laughs> I still say the best one was Disney's one. Yeah, the at, least, animated at least that one. had catchy tunes. And James Woods. Yeah. As um, Hades. We need to talk about the lion here. <laughs> okay, okay, talk about the lion. And now, <laughs> the hideous, is, hideous CGI is... prop. Is it even CGI? I, I don't I care. Swore it was animatronic. I, I really honestly thought, this is terrible. It's a carpet with someone's hand up its bum. I don't care. <laughs> it is. It's a basically big sock puppet. Um, I mean, we have to blame 300 for this. Mm-hmm. Because 300 ushered in all of the sword and sandal stuff that we still have today. All right, and the series and that that comes out. 300 launched them all, and then obviously it had Clash of the Titans, then it had Immortals. After it, we had Pompeii, the remake of Conan the Barbarian, the remake of Ben Hur that no one wanted. But it's the thing where we were talking about with Captivity being like the, the Saw knockoff. And we already had a Hercules movie coming out. I watched this, and I felt like. Did the asylum do this? Yeah, this is this is asylum. Well, no. To be honest, it's slightly slightly above asylum level quality. But, but. You, you're talking about this though being inspired by 300. This was eight years after 300 came out. Yeah, but they were still doing stuff like the Spartacus series and and all of that stuff was all born from uh, what 300 basically brought back to the mainstream. And this movie rips on that so much because you've got all of the slow-mo fight scenes and and stuff like that. And you've got Scott Adkins in the movie who basically looks like Jared Butler's double. He acts like Jared Butler's double as well. And does, yes. And to be fair to Scott, because he does get a lot of flack sometimes, he is actually probably the best performance in the entire movie. And that is not saying much. I, but he I probably is. I don't know if he's kind of laying it on thick deliberately or if that is an actual acting prompt that he was given by Rennie Harlan. Well, I honestly think they were said, we want like the character out of 300 and maybe Scott Atkins mistakenly rented Meet the Spartans <laughs> and, and, and took those acting cues off that guy who used to be in EastEnders. He actually did a better Jared Butler in Meet the Spartans than this guy did. I'm yeah, sorry. I know. I Meet the Spartans is just god-awful. Uh, the, but the acting throughout this movie, it's it's panto light. Mm. It is really bad acting. And I look at Rennie Harlan's movies and it's like, you know what? There's not bad acting in his movies. Some of them are great. Apparently, it was done within 11 months of Rennie Harlan first reading the script and it being completed. So the entire movie yeah. was made within a year, and it does show. Oh my god, it shows everything is so rushed. Um, it, but it's not really, it's not really things that are rushed on the surface level. It's just little things that you think, okay, if you'd have taken your time to just rethink a particular scene or a particular moment, things might have worked out better. Like, um, yeah. When they meet the Egyptian army in in the cave, I was going to say in the desert, but it's just a cave. They look like they're wearing masks that have been stolen from Stargate. Yes. <laughs> you think, yeah. no, spend a little bit more time, come up with something that would look a bit more original, 
and go for it. And also, speaking of the same scene, I, I had to rewind this to make sure I wasn't going nuts. When the soldiers are going through the cave, you can hear them going, hut, 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 hut. <laughs> that was it for me. I had to rewind it to think, have I missed that? No, no, he's taken that from Monty Python. Yes, the, G- the Judean people SWAT team. Yeah, with <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! You've not seriously put that in your movie. Oh my god! You have. Yeah, it's little things like that. Just take take that out. Doesn't need to be there. Yeah. It ruins what kind of. It ruins the shots that you're trying to make. It makes the bad ones look even worse. And considering what you actually have to begin with isn't very good. You want to do as much as you can to try and make it look a bit better. Yeah. And uh, they didn't. No. It was bad. I mean, Kellen Lutz, I mean, he got himself in phenomenal shape. I'll give him that. You know, yeah. he has got an amazing body. I mean, he was basically Emmett Cullen in the Twilight movies, wasn't he? Which I'm pretty sure your good lady probably pointed out to you. I've no idea. She didn't mention anything about that, and I've not seen him. So, yeah, we'll, we'll let that one go by. Yeah, yeah. I mean... Today, I think Kellen Lutz is mainly doing a lot of TV. I can't remember what the last big film I saw him in, uh, where he wasn't doing any of those Bruce Willis movies up in Nova Scotia. Oh, that's it. Well, he was doing uh, The Expendables 3 around the same time as this. Really? So he was actually in something that was a, had a little bit of a big budget. Yeah, but I reckon, I don't know which one came out first. <laughs> <laughs> between between the Expendables three and Hercules, I hope it was but, this one, just to yeah. try and save it, just to try and save anything from his career. Yeah, but um, you know, it, it was a bold casting choice. It doesn't really play. Dwayne Johnson probably looks a better Hercules, mm. but um, like I say, even that movie wasn't great either. Uh, so yeah, uh, the Legend of Hercules. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the only the only good thing that I can say about it is the, there's a there's a really nice fight scene in the middle where him and his mate are taking on what looks like Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers <laughs> and uh, and another gladiator called Rumbaba, um, and uh, that's quite a nice little set piece because they're on like the tops of these. Uh, columns, like kind of Stonehenge, yes, kind of uh, columns, and uh, the spike pits below them, and they're kind of hopping from one to the other. That's quite a nice little sequence, but yet again, it highlights the fact that the gore and the blood in this so sanitized. You you get the feeling like things were cut after the movie was originally yeah. Cut. This was shaved down to PG. You you do kind of sense that. It's like, we want to grab as much of an audience as we can, so why don't we just reduce the gore levels down so that kids can come and see it and increase our numbers. Yeah, but it feels like it was done after the movie was finished. After oh, everything was did. locked off, and they were about to take it to the distributors and make up the prints and all that. No, 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 cut that out. Because it, it's like the, there's a jarring disconnect between the, the end of like a blow and the next shot. And even to the point that there is one shot where he's in an arena and he stabs a guy through the chest. It's a great shot. And he kind of lifts him up on his sword, throws him up in the air with the sword still sticking out the front of his chest. And the guy lands flat on his stomach, but there's no blade sticking out the back. Mm. It's it's frustrating. Uh, They should have gone seriously hard R with this movie. Yeah, it might have at least made it interesting. I say if they would have made it just ridiculously over the top, you know, bodies exploding, fists of the North Star style, Mm -hmm. it would have made it, I think, more of a cult classic. Yeah. Even if the acting was still terrible. Yeah. Kind of a missed opportunity on that one. Grr. Argos. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So, Uh. yes, that was the legend of Hercules pulled out of the what's in the dungeon. Pulled out of your ass. The thing is, he's... It hasn't necessarily been a bad idea because there's been a couple of movies 
where we've agreed that they are better than we thought they sh- they should have be treated like 27 uh, sorry 47 ronin yeah from last week both of us agree that that deserved far higher placing on the uh, on the tomato ometer and yeah. even something like stigmata yeah. we said that that deserved to be a bit higher so it's only really been captivity in this that have just been atrocious. Although this did actually make me burst out laughing at some points because yeah. of just how rotten it is. Exactly. And, and that's where you glean the entertainment factor. I think captivity yeah. is sitting on our lowest for the time being. That could change. Captivity deserves to stay in the dungeon. At least this can be kind of yes. let out to walk around the yard once in a while. Yes, it it should follow its own rules in the movie and get locked away. Yes. Okay, well, now we've got the legend of Hercules out of the way. I guess we've got to look at some anniversaries for this week. We watch them again all of the time Or we get them on Prime for free But we only know how old they are When we learn their anniversary Keep rolling, rolling, rolling. I know, I know. Well, here we are. I mean, we're balls deep into November now. <laughs> yeah. No going back. We're we're counting down to Christmas. We're counting down to Mariah Carey in all her glory. The Coca Cola truck, all of that. But in the meantime, we still have to look at what was released in this week, all those years ago. Steve, are you ready to go back 40 years? Yes. I think. Good. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the movie is yet. I might not be ready. Well, I think you may have seen some of the choices for this week. I bloody well hope so, because we've not had much luck over the last few weeks. We never have much luck with films and you at all. So, you know, you're kind of a blank canvas and that's what we like. But I think it will be challenging for you not to have seen three of these four. Okay. So let's start. 40 years ago this week, George A. Romero's Creep Show was released. No, I haven't. Uh, this is the one I thought you might not have seen. No. So George A. Romero, he was the horror master. You know him from uh, the Living Dead movies, such as Night of the Living Dead, all-time classic, and in the public domain, don't you know? Yes. Uh, Land of the Dead, which featured a little cameo from Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. Diary of the find. Dead. Diary of the Dead, which is very underrated. And also there was Survival of the Dead. And of course, yeah, Dawn of the Dead as well, which is an all-time classic. Blog of the Dead. Day of the Dead, you know. Dead of the Dead. Yes. Other than that, he did also great little movies like uh, Monkey Shines and an adaptation of Stephen King's The Dark Half, which is a criminally undervalued movie. It is a really great movie. And speaking of which, this was the first time that George A. Romero teamed up with Stephen King to do an anthology movie of horror tales all linked in like a old style Tales of the Crypt comic book. Is is this like, um? oh, what was the other one? I think it was Tales from the Crypt or something, wasn't it? That had kind of like um like an anthology and there was kind of like a, a like a central host. Am I getting yes. this confused? Yeah, well, it's an old British movie called Tales from the Crypt, which Mark Marshall once told me was the scariest film he'd ever seen. Um, also, the UK used to do it a lot with movies like The Monster Club, which is another classic. Mm-hmm. Uh, in America, you had movies such as Tales from the Dark Side, the movie, um, obviously the Creep Show movies, and there was, what was the other one called? I can't um... remember. VHS are doing it now. So there's a series like that's gone to shudder that's called VHS, and they've just had another movie called VHS ninety nine released, and they do the whole anthology stories as well. Um, and Twilight actually, Zone did them. Yes, Twilight yes. Zone the movie. Yeah. Yes. So you know the kind of thing here. It's mm-hmm. a anthology movie where you've basically got different stories going through it, and in this, I believe there was five or six. I think there was five, but you also had actors in it like Leslie Nielsen. Uh, Ted Danson, Ed Harris in one of his first roles. And when you see Ed Harris dancing in this movie, you will not believe it. Go and Google Ed Harris dancing creep show. You will be amazed. Is it better than Jean-Claude Van Damme dancing? I put it right up there. 
Yeah. Right up there with it. I would love to see these two have a dance off. <laughs> so Stephen King, funnily enough, he actually got his start in his career writing short stories for porno mags. That doesn't surprise me. Uh, a number of people got their start doing porn. I think like uh, Gene's, I think it was either Gene Siskel or Roger Ebert, one of the two. I'm sure I heard something about them doing um, mucky stuff. I think John Williams started off with things like uh, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, which I think was a bit lascivious for the time. So, so you're basically saying it's a good entry position. Yes. <laughs> Any position works. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> you take uh, it how you can creep- get it. Well, Creepshow is an actual classic Nothing. movie. No, Come on. No, I'm not going down that way. That's, That's what, what she, she said. said. <laughs> yeah. uh, I beat you to it. But um, Creepshow is a classic movie of its kind, and it was followed by a not-so-good sequel and a terrible, absolutely shocking third director video, almost like it was shot on a handheld camera style movie that uh, I guarantee you say that to Jonas Barnes, Creepshow 3 it, he will just completely railroad you for even mentioning that movie. Oh, is that his Last Jedi? I, I think it would probably be up there. I think Exorcist Ooh. 2 is his Last Jedi, to be honest. Right. Um, but this, the first Creepshow movie, was the only George A. Romero movie to ever open at number one. Oh, that could be because of its more accessible subject matter, really. Quite possibly, I think it was the teaming of the the teaming of Stephen King, who was on his major high in both terms of the word (laughs) during the eighties with his movies. Um, You had everything. He even did an anthology of movie called Cat's Eye, uh, which is a little bit of a cult classic. You know that had three little stories in there. You had James Woods. Robert Hayes, Drew Barrymore. It's, it's pretty good, actually. I've got to admit, from what I remember of it. Uh, so I think Creepshow was the first in America to really do all of those kind of anthology movies. I know it was very popular in the UK prior to that, with Hammer Horror doing it all the time. But what was really interesting about this, in doing a bit of research and listening to the audio commentary and that this week, is the studio Warner Brothers were behind this movie and they trialed what became a very successful strategy in releasing this movie that really worked and made this movie a hit was that the fact that they actually released the movie (laughs) oh Oh. 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 typical folks (laughs) we're topical you can tell it was done this year Mm. so um what happened in july 1982 they booked several boston theaters and they basically ran the film out of Boston. It started to get a really strong word of mouth and they were getting good ticket sales on it. And while it was doing well, they actually ended the run. Now, prematurely. Now, the reason for this is very sound. During uh, the build-up to the end of October for Halloween, the main competition at the time was Universal and they were releasing Halloween 3 Season of the Witch. And they were releasing that the day before Halloween. So Warner Brothers, smart. Somebody was very smart there. They correctly guessed that Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, going away from the Michael Myers thing would fade very quickly. And everyone would want another horror film around that time. So they booked Creepshow to open widely right at the beginning of November, the 1st of November. And the strategy worked so well. People flocked to it. This film became a box office hit off of people who basically gave up on Halloween 3. Right, which, as far as I know, is everyone. Well, no, it's seen more as a cult classic nowadays. But I think back in the day, it was just too tonal a shift from... They they want Michael Myers with Halloween. It's the only movie that didn't have Michael Myers in it. Yeah, I think it was a brave attempt because they were trying to branch off and do this kind of series anthology thing, didn't they? Yeah. So Halloween 4 could have been, I don't know, like the the Body Snatchers and Halloween 5, the aliens from Zeta Reticuli or something like that. But no, they had to bring back The Shape again and again. Exactly. 
And again. But, you know, kudos to Warner Brothers. It was a very smart strategy they implemented. It made Creepshow a hit. It is now considered a cult classic. I mean, it's not a serious horror movie. It's crafted like it's reading a comic book. And it's done that way by design. It's fun. It's corny. It's campy. And this is something you could actually get your kids to watch on Halloween and they would not be terrified by it. Hmm. Especially nowadays, you know, a lot of it's pretty corny. You have uh, Stephen King doing an acting role in there who turns into a tree. Stephen King should never, ever be allowed to act. <laughs> well, I I judge it by the cocaine meter of exactly what he was on around that time. Didn't he write an entire book and completely blank on ever writing it? Something like I Christine know. or Cujo or something, a, bit, a really popular one that he was either completely off his nut on drugs or he was so drunk that he has no memory whatsoever of writing the damn book. I know that when he made Maximum Overdrive, that movie was made by cocaine, basically. <laughs> so I don't think he has any recollection of making that movie because he was wildly out of his face on cocaine. Eh, work for the Blues Brothers. Yeah, exactly. But yes, uh, Creepshow, it's well worth a watch. If you can find it, you can find it everywhere. There's uh, anniversary of edition Blu-rays out now with great documentaries on there. Uh, it's definitely worth your time to check this out. It is fun. Okay. Well, it's, it's a good, it sounds like a good one to start off with. Would have been better if it had come out a few weeks ago, but at least you actually put it out, Warner Brothers. So well done you. Um, right. So what is the next on our list? What year are we going okay. back to now? Well, funny enough, um, this one we have actually spoken on before in the Get It Fresh round. But I thought it was worth bringing up again, because 35 years ago this week, The Running Man was released. Ah, now yes, I have seen this one. I I knew you would have seen this one. Yes. And directed by Starsky himself, Paul Michael Glazer. And if you're thinking... Really? Yeah. Yeah, you didn't know that? I didn't know that, no. Yeah, yeah, he was the director, and... I don't think Arnie wanted him to direct it uh, because Paul Michael Glazer was mainly directing TV at that time, like Miami Vice. He did an actual brilliant episode of Miami Vice called The Prodigal Son, which I think is one of my favourite ever TV episodes from the 80s. It really is fantastic. (laughs) Oh, for some reason, I could picture him. He's just trying to direct while constantly sliding over the bonnet of a car. Just back and forth, <laughs> back and forth. That's great, Arnold. <laughs> now I need you to do it more intently. <laughs> well, I mean, funnily enough, I mean, it's not the only movie he has directed. He directed uh, a movie called The Cutting Edge that starred D.B. Sweeney and Moira Kelly about ice skating. Uh, he also did a basketball movie with Kevin Bacon called The Air Up There. And keeping with the sports theme, he directed Shaq and Kazam. Yay. Yay. And I think that was the last movie he directed as well. I think so. And in keeping with the theme of this week, The Running Man was also written by Stephen King. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, I... Or Richard Richard Bachman. Sorry, sorry, Richard Bachman. Wait, was we that his to... nom de plume? Yes. Yes. That is, is what? His pomme de terre? <laughs> yes. Uh, as far as I know, I think many people kind of attribute this to Philip K. Dick, mainly because he, I think they get him mixed up with Total Recall. And also right. that uh, Philip K. Dick just did so many sci-fi films that they oh, yeah. think it was that. No, no. I mean, this is this is one of those movies that you think, in the hands of a different director like Paul Verhoeven, it would be <laughs> still be camp. But I think it might have a little bit more of an edge to it. This has got a wonderful oppressive totalitarian regime feel but at times it just gets a little bit too silly but not in the silly way that Verhoeven stuff does well this was the ultra violence era it came out the same Mm. year as Robocop so it probably was the most violent year in cinema yeah it does it doesn't quite turn your stomach though in the same way no you know you watch something like Robocop and just the guy just getting eviscerated by Ed 209 at the beginning and it just going on for so so long Whereas in this, you've just got a guy who loses his fingers to a bit of barbed wire. It's not, it's not quite the same. 
yet it kind no. of feels like it should be the same. This feels like what you would be watching on TV if you lived in the world of RoboCop. Well, what is actually interesting, you mentioned about the other director. Did you know that when filming started, Paul Michael Glazer was not the director on that movie? Was Paul Verhoeven supposed to be doing it? No. Interestingly enough, Andrew Davis started directing that movie. Who's Andrew Davis? Andrew Davis, uh, prior to this, he directed uh, a movie with Chuck Norris called Code of Silence, which was probably Chuck Norris's one of best, his best movies. Uh, but he went on to direct Fugitive. He also uh, directed uh, Chain Reaction with Keanu Reeves. Uh, he'd done a lot of really big movies. Uh, the Fugitive, I think, being his biggest standout film. He also did uh, Above the Law with Steven Seagal, back when Steven Seagal was actually seen as an A-lister instead of an A-holer. Mm. Um, so he started on this movie and apparently uh, was let go for whatever reason. And f- Paul Michael Glazer was brought in. And then Arnold was not happy with Paul Michael Glazer. He felt he made the movie seem like it was a, a TV movie, which... I guess when you kind of look at it, there are elements that do yeah. feel that way. I, th- I think the lighting, for one, feels very flat. In in the scenes prior to him going into the game, Yeah, uh, a lot of it does feel very kind of... It, it's got that feel that the, the boardroom stuff in RoboCop has. Sorry to keep harking on about that. Yeah. Everything just looks flat and very uh, well lit without much in the way of depth. Yeah. Uh, it, it's hard to disagree with that. It's true. Hmm. Uh, you know, that's Reaganomics for you, I guess. Yeah. Um, what we kind of got to look here in doing my think piece on The Running Man this week, is this movie guilty of giving us American gladiators? It's entirely yes. possible, yeah. Yes, which means it gave us gladiators, which means it gave us wolf. <laughs> which means it gave us jet. Well, well, yeah. Um, less said about that, the better. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> but uh, this film also gave us the first instance of face swapping technology. Was that where they were? Uh, oh God, I I can picture the scene, but I can't see it off the top of my head. Oh so yeah, it's th- when they do the dummy video of Arnie's character yes, getting that's killed it. by Captain Freedom. Yeah, and that's now a thing that you even have on your phone. Like many things, this movie did predict a lot of stuff, like the rise of um, reality TV, and oh, it's kind. There's a lot of stuff in it that you can watch now and think, "Oh God, that feels a bit dated." But realistically, you look back and think, "Wow, they actually managed to think a lot of stuff that became real." Yeah, if you think of how extreme the games are and everything, and well, there isn't anything quite like that. You look at the shows that we've had over the years, like Survivor, and even I'm a Celebrity, where you get people going through really, really shit stuff. Yeah. The most meager payouts. It's like definitely the chase. was ahead of its time. <laughs> yeah. Hey, look, I did well on the chase. Thank you very much. I didn't get any money, but I did well. Yes. Seven grand in the cash builder, and I got caught to you from home, in case anybody's wondering. Yes. It is out there. Uh, but this also gave one of the first versions of, like, Sierra and Alexa. Mm. When Maria Conchito Alonso, you know, she walks into her house and she's, like, speaking out to something and suddenly all of these things are turning on. It predated it. Yeah. You know that thing where The Simpsons thought of it first? The Running Man thought of that stuff even before The Simpsons. At least it bloody works in The Running Man. Yeah, it does. It does. Uh, another interesting fact about this movie that I learned from uh, the audio commentary just recently is this movie was actually moved back by something like five months. So it didn't compete with what was expected to be the big movie of that year. Do you know what it was? Uh, when was this? 1987? Seven. 1987. This might um, be one of the only instances this has happened. Was it Masters of the Universe or something like that? No. So they moved back the Arnold Schwarzenegger starring The Running Man so that it didn't open the same weekend as the Arnold Schwarzenegger starring Predator. (laughs) Oh! Oh, oh. Mm. Both good for very different reasons. Yeah, but can you imagine them opening on the same night? Jesus Christ. He was unstoppable in the 80s. Yeah, it's no wonder Arnie was ruling 87. Yeah. 
Speaking of which, though, yes. he also had his mate in it as well, Sven Olaf Thorson. Yes, and Jesse Ventura was in both of them as well. Yep. So maybe they moved this back because they didn't want to compete with the Jesse Ventura film that was coming out later in the year. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. Oh. Maybe. That could be the case. But yes, uh, The Running Man is 35 years old this week. Uh, I don't believe it's dated that much. I think it's still an amazing movie. It's it's a guilty pleasure for me, as I noted on our Get It Fresh episode. Um, there, there is stuff which has aged. I think the themes haven't aged. I no. think I think the themes are still just as relevant as they are, probably more so today than they were back in the 80s. The actual film itself, visual effects, performances and so on, I think I th- I think that hasn't held up the test of time too well, though, in no. some parts. Um, but it, it's still a film. I'm, I'm glad they never went ahead with the remake of it. Yeah, me too. I don't want no sanitised version of it, although you can say The Hunger Games is basically the same thing. But yes, The Running Man... Definitely worth watching any time you find it. Or if you've not seen it, go and hunt it out. You just will not believe how sadistic we all were in the 80s. Yeah. We wanted blood, damn it. Right. Well, that is a cracker to... We, we're doing well so far. I'm liking the first two. What have we got for the third? Okay. Uh, I chose the third one because it is a very underrated film that I love. It was 25 years ago this week that Copland was released. Okay, now that one I haven't seen. So you'll have to talk us through this. Okay, so Copland was directed by James Mangold, Mm -hmm. who I'm sure most of you know as the director of Logan, Mm -hmm. or Le Mans 66, or Ford vs. Ferrari, if you're from the UK. He also directed Walk the Line, Johnny Cash. And also, prior to Copland, he directed a movie called Heavy, that starred Liv Tyler and Pruitt Taylor Vince. Pruitt Taylor Vince getting a shout out on the show again this week. See, we told you you were better. Who? From Captivity. Oh. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, this was the movie that made the headlines because of Stallone's weight gain. He obviously put on all of the weight to play this uh, simple sheriff in this small town. Uh, and it was his way of seeing his career resurgence after a few duds. He really thought this was going to elevate him into the A game. He went on to say, well, realistically, it did worse. No, it didn't. (laughs) No, it didn't. Daylight that was released prior to this did worse. Trust me. I Um, saw that at the cinema. Oh, God, it's horrible. I've I've watched it again recently because I thought, you know what, it wasn't that bad. And I watched it again recently. I was like, oh, my God. Acting is horrible. It's actually the only other film, say, for Lord of the Rings that I've seen Viggo Mortensen in. <laughs> really? Nearly. Oh, well, we've got to... Oh, no, sorry, sorry. Um, Kalito's Way, he was in that as well. Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. What's in the box? Yep. This movie had probably one of the most incredible casts for an ensemble cast, and they all worked at scale. Every single talent worked at scale to do this movie. The script was that good, and it is. So, apart from Sylvester Stallone, you had Robert De Niro, Harvey Keitel, Ray Liotta, Annabella Sciorra, Robert Patrick, uh, Michael Rappaport. Just incredible names in this movie. All the way down the line, even to the small bit players, were, were names. And all of them worked for scale. And this was, I believe, one of James Mangold's movies that I don't think they really wanted him to direct. I don't think they had a lot of confidence in him. He'd done maybe an independent movie that did okay. Uh, but I don't think Stallone initially was just like, yeah, well, you know, I don't really know the guy. But read the script, had the meeting with him. Uh, the producer was Kathy Conrad, who uh, James Mangold went on to marry following this movie. And they since have had this partnership where they've done all these movies like Logan, um, The Wolverine, Le Mans 66, all of these movies. Uh, I think what made it suffer at the box office, and it did suffer at the box office, is the fact that it's not an action movie. This is an actor's movie. Okay, so it's, it's not a thrill ride. It is a very tight and intelligent thriller based around um, these corrupt police officers who kind of own this small town in like New Jersey that they call Copland because all the police and their families move there and it's a very safe environment. And obviously there's corruption there. There's a, the cover-up of um, an, an accidental shooting. Well, say accidental. 
Uh, I won't give it away because it is going to be in the box for you. That is if we get back that way. Well, we are. We are going to get back that way. We're going to have to soon, otherwise we're just going to lose the will to live. <laughs> the best thing I can heighten this to, we look at Sylvester Stallone's character, who is deaf. So he's deaf in one ear. And it's, he is kind of simple. So he's the sheriff of this copland. So basically just an honorary little role. You're the sheriff of a town of cops. And he's he's looked down on by all the other police officers that are there. But he sees the wrongdoing and is then very conflicted about it and then is trying to right the wrongs of his town. It gets very high noon, if you're familiar with the movie High Noon. You know, the old Western movie where it's the sheriff on his own in this town of people who are out to get him. And it's an amazing movie with amazing performances. Uh, one of Ray Liotta's best, I'd, I'd argue, one of Harvey Keitel's best, De Niro, everyone. It's incredible. And this probably is, apart from when we were talking about First Blood or Rocky the other week, this I would put up there in Sly Stallone's genuine can-act roles. And he's amazing in it. This is his Mount Rushmore. I would put this on his Mount, R- Mount Rushmore. He probably Mouse, wouldn't. Mount Rushmore, Mount Rushmore. Yes. yes. Was Sean Mount Connery Rushmore. in this? No. I would put it on his Mount Rushmore. I don't know whether he will. I know that he took a bit of a financial blow and then started doing movies like Avenging Angelo and Driven and stuff like that. So he was trying to claw his way back up, which didn't happen until he went back to Rocky Balboa, I guess. But Copland is an amazingly tight, suspenseful, well-written, incredibly performed and directed movie. And if you have not seen it, you are missing out hugely. Okay, so that's that's one to note for then, I guess. That's yeah, so... it's it's in the positive box at least. Okay, um, right, all right. So that's three down. We got one more. Yes, we have one more to go. All right, and not surprisingly, this is going to happen probably every year of this show now for the next few years. Twenty years ago this week, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets was released. Right. Yes. I have seen it. I've seen yes. them all. And this was back in the early days of Harry Potter when you could actually see the film. Oh, yes. I'm I'm looking at you, Half-Blood Prince. God's sake. Well, this one was noticeably darker than the first. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely had its moments. That, yeah, I, I, remember when we, I remember when we were talking with Bill and he was saying about how the change of the tone started to get more and more serious as it went on. Yes. And well, I think because they were growing up. And I think this was where it started to first become noticeable. Because yeah. it, it things do get quite dark in this movie at yes. times. Um particularly with the whole basilisk thing and the, the reveal of Tom Marvolo riddle and oh God. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not a Harry Potter fan. I'm saying oh. it right now, I'm not. You blasphemer. I'm not, I'm sorry. When all this was coming out, I was busy reading Discworld, you know. Oh, so you're on the Discworld side. Yeah. Is there a natural animosity between the Harry Potter and Discworld people? No, but... Or um, you're more, no, you're on the Lord of the Rings side, though, really, aren't you? I'm more of the Lord of the Rings, yeah. Definitely more of the Lord of the Rings. Um, speaking of which, I did actually meet Terry Pratchett a couple of times, and he was let's let's say quite diplomatic when the subject of his feelings about Harry Potter were brought up. Um, yeah, he he refused to comment on them. To be to be put frankly, interesting. Yes, yeah. Yours? Um, no, I've seen them because I didn't see them until I'd say about. Three, four years ago, I missed the whole wave of hype that came along with the initial release of the films. So to me, they don't really mean anything. And I've I've, I've sat there and I've watched it from one end to the other, and they just kind of drag a bit. And it, well, yeah, it, I mean, come on, we were in our twenties when Harry Potter was released, so it was a generation under us that basically really grew up with Harry Potter. Yeah, they, they got Harry Potter. And people our age were were watching Lord of the Rings. Yeah, we were watching that, the classic fiction. That's a fiction. fair comment. That is a fair comment. I was more 
interested in Lord of the Rings than I was Harry Potter around that time. I was more interested in Liv Tyler than Moaning Myrtle. <laughs> yes. Well, that's fair enough. But let's let's discuss Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets here just for a moment. So this was the second Harry Potter directed by Chris Columbus and the last, mm-hmm. I believe. Yeah, it was. I'm right. I don't think yeah. it came out for... Was the third one Goblet of Fire? No, it was Prisoner of Azkaban was, was the it... third one, I believe. God, I can't remember. I know, it gets confusing. Uh, but yes, he directed Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Sorcerer's Stone. But you also know Chris Columbus from doing the family movies like Home Alone, Home Alone 2, Mrs. Doubtfire, etc., etc. Adventures in Babysitting, if you really want to go back that far. Um, this was also the last Harry Potter to feature Richard Harris as Dumbledore, mm. who sadly passed away from, was it Parkinson's or Hodgkin's disease? One of I, I think it was a broken liver at that point. Uh, it was one or the other. Um, but yes, everyone remembers Richard Harris as Dumbledore, even though he only did it for two movies. And when you say Dumbledore, that's the version of Dumbledore that always jumps into my head. And I think that's mainly because I probably have seen the first and second Harry Potter more than the others. I think I saw the second one and I've glancingly seen the other ones. I know I have to go back and revisit them, which through the gloriousness of uh, the anniversary section. I can at least watch one every year now. Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, it was the longest of the Harry Potter movies out of all of them. Which is weird, really, because every single movie has more or less the same plot. Oof. Harry starts off at home, gets abused somehow, escapes to Hogwarts, his life's in danger, his friends are in danger, the staff do nothing, he must try and sort out the problem. He sorts out the problem. The end of the movie and in between the entire school year goes past. Not right. once do you see him sit down and do his exams. Oh, Bill's going to kick your ass. I'm telling he you. really is. But, so, <laughs> Oh, yeah, you're fucked. <laughs> Thank God we're recording next the next week. episode before this goes out. Oh, I'm telling him anyway. Yeah. Um, so for it being the longest movie, but it was the shortest book. Okay. Which is interesting. Also, uh, I believe Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets is the reason that the Scooby-Doo movie became a hit. Why? Because the trailer was attached to it. Oh, okay. That makes so sense. A lot of people bought tickets to Scooby-Doo just to see that trailer and then left. What, which is a shame. What scooby did not that with movie. The Phantom Menace? There, was, there a... was, wasn't there? Yeah, there, there was... was um, Oh, God, I can't remember what movie it was. I've I... spoken about this before, recently. That That's it. We can't even remember the movie. They just remember going to see the trailer. Yeah, going to see... It was something, probably something like that. I know, the Tom and Jerry movie or something like that. Yes. I don't know. Uh, this this was also the Harry Potter movie that introduced us to Vladimir Putin. Oh, sorry, Dobby. Dobby the house elf. Yes. <laughs> he does look like Vladimir Putin. I don't know. Uh, You're going I to saw... be having an accident uh, very soon, aren't you? Oh, well, I'm at that age. Accidentally, mysteriously, very sadly, cut his head off while shaving. It's all right. I've got a sock. Um, so What? <laughs> you've got, what the hell does that mean? You've got a sock? Yeah, you just give it to him. Oh, of course, Dobby. Him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God. Oh, fucking hell. Ru- um. Ruin at least a good comeback joke. Um, what I can also tell you is... Apparently, I'll say apparently because Bill will correct me on this. Uh, Dumbledore's office at the time was the most expensive set ever built. Okay. Because it was very intricate and apparently um, Chris Columbus and I want to say the set designer, I'll, I'm sorry if I get this name wrong, I think his name is Stuart Craig. Uh, they wanted it to be really intricate and very, very detailed. and They managed to get the money from the producers to actually do that. And it is an impressive set. I'll give it that. Mm. And uh, they would have gotten all that money back because this was the first movie ever to achieve a million DVD sales on its release. One million DVDs. Exactly. That's quite a boast to have. This was also the first Harry Potter movie to be nominated for an Oscar. Uh, Best special effects? I would reckon so. Yeah. Safe bet. 
And it was also the only Harry Potter film out of all of them to have a post credit scene. Yes, it's... Some people have gone years without knowing this. I do actually know this. It's a... Are they all eating shawarma? No, it's a shot of Diagon Alley. And the camera comes down and there's a bookshop there. And uh, it's featuring Gilderoy Lockhart's book called Who Am I? And he's there on the front cover kind of moving around looking as if he's a bit stunned, just looking from one part to the other, just going, ah, ah, ah. That's it. Yeah. So that is there for those of you Harry Potter fans who never bothered staying past the credits. You can go and find that now. Yeah. Um, I don't know what they're streaming on nowadays. It's probably Now TV over here. Uh, Warner Brothers, so... Yeah, it'd be Now TV, Yeah, I reckon. You can probably get it on Sky because Sky's part of Now TV. Or the other way around, yes. I should say. And there was something I that was interesting just before. As I was kind of writing these facts out, something popped up. Um, no, don't even go there. All really? Right. Have you still got your sock? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but a bum Hey! Uh, apparently, there was something I saw that popped up in a news thing. I mean, one, we've lost Leslie Phillips this week. Yes. British legend, Gex himself. Ding dong. Yes. But Warner Brothers has, well, David Zaslov. Bless you. Yeah. David Zaslov has confirmed that the Wizarding World is over. Oh, so after the latest Aliman is fantastical, they're not doing anything else. Yeah. Oh. So no more Wizarding World stuff, so the Fantastic Beast stuff, uh, I guess that's gone now. Yeah. I mean, the last movie was released, was it Secrets of Dumbledore? Uh, it was not a success, was it? It, it was, it kind of came out and went. It did. I remember there being a lot of pre-release hype, obviously, because the whole Johnny Depp thing had stirred up a lot of stuff. And then J.K. Rowling's remarks about uh, the transsexual community, that was stirring up a shit ton more. And the films yeah. themselves weren't really as wildly received as the others. And it was just a bit meh. And then all of a sudden the film came out and it went off again. I always found it a kind of weird choice. The, the Harry Potter series was so dependent on the support of the readers. It was just an odd choice to make a completely original film series from it. I think we had a good talk with Bill about it, where it's like the best thing they could have done with Harry Potter was with the Lego franchise. You know, like the Lego movie, Lego mm-hmm. Batman movie? Yeah. Doing a Harry Potter Lego movie. I think that would be cool. Because well, they yeah. also own the rights to Lord of the Rings, and that is the best way you can do a crossover. Oh, no, they kind of did that in the Lego movie because you had both Gandalf and yeah. um, He Who Shall Not Be Named in there separately. I don't think they had any yeah. screen time. But... I just don't think... I mean, the first Fantastic piece, I thought, okay, yeah, this is pretty good. But the last two... I mean, one, they've changed the villain's character three times or something. Oh, Ezra Miller as well. That's another wrinkle to it all. Oh, oh, God. That we had to bring up Ezra Miller. So Jesus you've got three Christ. major controversies following one film series. Yeah, I mean, the, Warner Brothers do have Harry Potter movies and TV shows in development. So, you know, it's far from over. I mean, Fantastic Beasts 4 could still happen. I mean, they've not announced anything. They've kind of discussed a Harry Potter HBO Max series being in development. They could adapt Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. Yeah, yeah, that could be explored. And no doubt you'll still have the video games and everything else. Well, but... there is a new video game coming out uh, called, I think it's called Hogwarts Legacy, that's right. due out at the beginning of next year, kind of like about February, March time, something like that. Yet again, that's been mired by a little bit of its own controversy because of the console exclusivity on PlayStation. Oh, so much controversy in Harry Potter nowadays. Jeez. I know. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's... <laughs> I didn't even watch The Secrets of Dumbledore or whatever it's called because the second one, the second Fantastic Beast, I was kind of bored by it. I was like, it just doesn't have that same magic as the Harry Potter films had. So I'm not sad to see the back of them. I'm just sad that they couldn't have actually done a better movie. And I think the main problem is uh, people just don't have that passion. I don't think the filmmakers have the same passion that the people making the Harry Potter movies had. No. I think they were more just doing it 
for the money. Yeah, when you're adapting the book, you are trying to bring, you are trying to make money, yeah, but you're also trying to take this thing that people already yeah. like and turn looking it at you, rings of power. Nah. Um, I'm I'm detaching myself from rings of power. I'm just saying, no, it's not canon. Just enjoy it. Um, <laughs> if you can, but you you've got you've got this thing which people like. Make a film out of it, great. And then you've got this other thing that people have said, well, we're not really too keen on that, but the still churning them out just seems to be because, no, we can make money on this. And if that's all it yeah. is, then there's no point in watching them. Yeah, exactly. Anyway. Um, so yeah, sorry, just getting back. Harry Potter, Chamber of Secrets, 20 years old this week. Happy birthday, Harry Potter. And Steve's relationship with Bill Daly... Is about to go down the toilet. Two years ended. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right now, <laughs> following this. It's about to get flushed down the Chamber of Secrets. Yeah. Oh, yes. And speaking of stuff which should also be flushed away, it's time to answer that everlasting question. What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? Oh, yeah. Is it what's in the box? What's in the box, brother? Yeah. Okay. We're going to be picking out some movies, yeah. I can't do that voice oh. for too long because my throat's been knackered this week. Imagine he, how he felt. Ah. Good old bone so. Yeah. Anyway, what's what's in the box, Steve, for this season? I have a mouthful of water. What's in the box? is the part of the show where Andy is going to pick out a name of a movie that is certified rotten on Rotten Tomatoes, i.e. it is scored at least 25% or under critic score. If he pulls out the name of a film that I have seen, he's going to keep pulling out names until we find one that I haven't seen, and then I'm going to go away and watch it before we record our next episode. It's easy. We used to do with good movies. Now we're at the other end of the spectrum. We will be doing it with good movies again, yeah. but... Uh... But not today, as Tom Cruise would say. Um, oh, oh, well, I oh. think you're actually going to enjoy this for the wrong reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you know fill me said, with hope. You, you know, we're like going back to movies that are so terrible, you get so much enjoyment from them. Yeah. Well, we're heading back to Warner Brothers, <laughs> back to the year 1995. Okay. Where somebody thought Cindy Crawford was going to be the next big Julia Roberts. Is this for a movie getaway? called Fair Game? Oh, no, I've not seen it. <laughs> well, you will. Oh, Does oh she my get God. Naked? Ye yes. In a European version, not the American version. Oh, good. I'm hunting down the European version then. <laughs> of course you would. It's like Troy all over again. So, yes, fair game. 1995, an hour and a half, you can spare that much, for a movie ranked at 12%. Oh, thank God it's not very long. Although, to be honest, I say that about all the really good movies, so, you know. <laughs> True. Amanda oh. says the exact same when... Yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, 12%. This is... It's going to be a bit fun for you, because... Originally, this was supposed to be a Sylvester Stallone movie, and they ended up with William Baldwin. <laughs> they couldn't even get the good Baldwin. <laughs> oh, dear. Stephen Baldwin, oh, he's busy. <laughs> oh, dear. He's doing Biodome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. oh, my God. Oh, he's in the convertible, just smoking pot with Polly Shaw. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you know what? I, I'm actually in a right mind to ask Bill to come on and we will do a viewing party on this movie. Oh, God. I think that is something that needs to happen because, funnily enough, 
there was a point where I was actually talking to him about fair game and we had the exact same laughing fit just from <laughs> saying the words fair game. So I know the stories behind this movie that he can tell us. I think uh, we need to bring Bill in on this one. Well, he's going to tell you after completely slaughtering the sacred cow that was Harry Potter. I'm never going to be allowed to talk to him ever again. True. There's going to be a cease True. and desist. He is so proud of all his work on those movies. Um, it was nice knowing you, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, fair game. Oh my God. No, I've, I've got to ask Bill to come in on this one. Fair, fair game is uh, the movie for next week. <laughs> okay, and with that in mind and the, the end of my podcasting career on the horizon... Um, I think that's the end of our show today. If you'd like to comment on anything that we've talked about throughout the last hour or so, then you can join in the conversation over on Twitter at Poddywood. That is if Elon Musk hasn't ruined it even further. You can join in the conversation on Facebook at Poddywood. That is if Mark Zuckerberg hasn't ruined that any further. And you can also follow us on YouTube or, you know, just everywhere. Social media is imploding, people. Yes. Come join us on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Clay. Our second favorite for. platform. Oh, God. How do, how do you get LinkedIn? Seriously. No, no, wait, no wait. seriously. I, I, I set us up on LinkedIn. And we have a tremendous following on there. Um, we've just hit, I think, 509 people are following the, um, the Partywood LinkedIn page. I'm not surprised. How many of those are recruiters from Des Moines? <laughs> How many of them want me to want to build our website? Yeah. Oh God. Uh, and with that in mind, it is a goodbye yes. from me. Yes. I mean, I've got to get out, dude. I've really got to get out of here. Right, I'll see you later. Thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs>